Welcome to the monthly webcast presented by Pro Bono Partnership Atlanta. My name is Amy Jensen, and I'm going to talk today about legal issues regarding internship programs at nonprofits. I'm an associate at the law firm of Paul Hastings and represent employers on issues including wage and hour, anti-discrimination laws, and other matters affecting employee-employer relationships. The mission of Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta is to maximize the pro bono engagement by connecting a network of attorneys with nonprofits in need of free business legal services. This next slide has a list of the eligibility requirements for being assigned to pro bono partnership, including being a 501c3, located in the Atlanta area, serving disadvantaged in individuals. Um, you can visit Pro Bono Partnership on the web where you can find lots of great articles written by practicing attorneys and more of these webcasts like this one today. This next slide has some legal information that's important for you to consider. This webinar prevents, presents only general guidelines for Georgia nonprofit organizations and should not be construed as legal advice. Always consult an attorney with your specific questions. So we're going to talk today about nonprofit internships, where interns are receiving no wages or a wage below minimum wage. The Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, is the federal law that um, governs employee wages and overtime pay, record keeping standards, and lots of other um, requirements for nonprofits, for profit organizations who employ employees. We understand that many nonprofits are going to be focused on their mission and may not be as aware of all of the certain requirements under the FLSA that would require them to uh, meet certain standards. You often may think that people helping your organization wouldn't bring suit against you or that different rules may apply to nonprofits. So we're going to talk today about how internships are governed under the FLSA. Simply labeling something an internship does not necessarily make it one under the FLSA. So we'll discuss how to determine if your internship is actually an internship under the rules that would apply. So the FLSA only governs employees, but the law takes a broad view of what constitutes an employee, as opposed to a volunteer, an independent contractor, a trainee, or an intern. Under the FLSA, Employers may not suffer or permit an employee to work without compensating them. An employee is a very broad term, so exclusions are necessarily quite narrow. If an intern is a non-exempt employee, he or she must be compensated with minimum wage and overtime compensation. So unpaid internships are not necessarily impermissible in all circumstances. The Supreme Court has held the term suffer or permit to work cannot be interpreted so as to make a person who works for his or her own, in own interest an employee of another who's providing aid or instruction. So to qualify as a non-employee employee employer relationship, the Department of Labor has established a six-factor test for internships that would seem to apply equally to two nonprofits and for profits. The departments have said that an internship program should meet all six factors. However, later in the program, we will discuss a DOL statement regarding nonprofit internships that may prove helpful in defending any possible suits on this issue. So first, we're going to go through the six factors that must be applied when determining whether an internship or an employment relationship exists. We're going to go through each of them individually with examples so we can better understand them as well. So the following six criteria must be applied. One, the internship, even though it includes actual operation of the facilities of the employer, is similar to training, which would be given in an educational environment or vocational school. Second, the internship experience is for the benefit of the intern. Third, the intern does not displace employees, but works under close supervision of existing staff. Fourth, the employer that provides the training derives no immediate advantage from the activities of the intern, and on occasion, its operations may be impeded. Fifth, the intern is not necessarily entitled to a job at the conclusion of the internship. And sixth, the intern and the employee understand that the intern is not entitled to wages for the time spent in the internship. So factor one. 
the internship is similar to training in an actual educational environment. These examples are for programs that would pass the first factor. First one, a university externship program that sent students out to various corporate sponsors to shadow employees for a week. In this example, you may have interns performing small office tasks or assisting with projects, but they would not generally be performing the work for the employer. Second example is an internship program where training resembled a college course. Interns were given an outline, syllabus, and assignments, and a company supervisor was working with a faculty coordinator. In this example, while the intern would be performing some work of regular staff members, they would also be receiving significant training along with the program. So the takeaway under factor one is to try to structure your internship around a classroom or an academic setting as opposed to the actual employer's operations. It's helpful if you can collaborate with a high school, university, or vocational school to provide credit for your internship. Here's some examples of internship programs that have been considered unacceptable by the Department of Labor or case law. One where interns drove unloaded, loaded trucks, stocked shelves, um, filled out paperwork. Here the employer was just using its interns to try to service a route. So the instruction was not one which one would receive in a general vocational course. Uh, it's important to try not to teach just job functions that are specific to only your own organization but to provide more general training for your interns. Second is interns who are providing janitorial duties, kitchen duties, um, performing yard work. These interns were working for a steel fabrication and welder profession. The duties that they were given did not prepare them for placement within a technical trade. So one takeaway for that is to ensure that the duties are the type that would be assigned typically to employees who would work in the trade or that the assignments would prepare them for placement within that trade. And generally, you'd like to avoid grunt work for your interns. So factor two looks at whether the internship is for the benefit of the intern. Of course, an intern is almost always receiving some benefit from an internship, whether it might be the form of exposure to certain industries or connection with certain individuals. Showing that criteria one, which is the training element, and criteria four, that an employer gets no immediate advantage, are met, are help, helpful to establish that an intern is the primary beneficiary of the internship. If the intern internship provides a true educational experience, it is more likely that the intern is going to be considered the primary beneficiary. Some examples under factor two. Um, an intern who performs work that uses skill applicable to the job type as a whole is more likely to meet this factor. Where interns who are performing filing, general clerical work, filling out paperwork, assisting customers are less likely to meet this factor. This sort of work is more likely to be applicable to only the employer's business or otherwise narrowly focused, which is going to provide an intern with fewer benefits in the long run. Factor three has two parts. The first one is whether the intern displaces regular employees. Uh, the test that you can use to evaluate this factor is without the internship, would the employer have to hire additional employees? If the employer would have to increase current employee workloads or hire new employees had the internship not been created, even if only for seasonal or peak times, the interns may be considered employees. So if you're dependent on your unpaid interns to operate your organization, you may want to rethink um, your program and how you're using your interns. This also bleeds into the fourth factor, which is the advantages to an employer. The second part of factor three is whether the intern works under close supervision of staff. Obviously, the more supervision, the better. Um, keep in mind, if an employer is supervised in the same way as regular employees, it suggests the existence of an employment relationship. Ideally, you have an intern who's learning under active supervision, receiving ongoing feedback, and performing minimal productive work. Uh, employers that satisfy this factor often have the intern spending the majority of his or her time shadowing or observing regular employees rather than doing the job of those employees. And when you're providing supervision, it need only be from other staff, not necessarily from managers. 
So factor four looks at whether an employer derives no immediate advantage from intern's activities, and actually the operations of the employer may be impeded by the existence of the internship. This can be a difficult factor. Um, for the most part, you're wanting interns because they are providing you some sort of benefit. Otherwise, why would you have them? So courts are going to look at weighing the advantages with the disadvantages. There are a couple ways that you can ensure your interns are providing you with a few disadvantages. Um, one is making the internship short. The shorter the internship, the less helpful the intern can be. Startup costs for training and mistakes are going to increase um, on a shorter time frame. And the more expert an intern is at performing his or her task, the more training, the more benefit the employer derives from his intern. So as a result, try to keep your internship short, generally fewer than 13 weeks. Uh, training and supervision. Adding additional costs by training and supervising your intern is going to show that you're in, in possibly impeding the work of the organization by offering those benefits to your interns. Uh, it also increases the educational benefit for the intern, which is going to help with factors one, two, and three. The third way you can do this is by rotating the areas in which an intern works. By rotating the areas, the intern has less of a chance to become an expert in one area, and it's um, providing fewer advantages to the employer. So unacceptable examples under this factor are internships of a long duration, where the intern requires no further training, an internship with no training or supervision given beyond what regular employees receive, or an employer being reliant on the intern to make its quotas or to otherwise carry out its work. Overall, it's important to ensure that the intern internship program is predominantly for the benefit of the interns and that the productive work performed by the interns is offset by the burden to the employer. Under factor five, you'll look at whether the intern is automatically entitled to a job at the conclusion of the internship. The best way to ensure the interns do not feel any entitlement to a job is to manage expectations at the start. Uh, this can be done by setting a duration up front and having interns sign an agreement that expressly states that they are not entitled to a job. By hiring in interns regularly and making it sort of a trial period for employment, you may create an expectation of employment with interns. And we'll cover the uh, use of an agreement a little later on in more detail. Factor six is that the employer and the intern understand that the intern is not entitled to wages. Um, again, we'll discuss agreements a little later on, but that's one way that you can create that mutual understanding of no compensation. If you're going to provide a stipend, you should not exceed a reasonable approximation of the expenses actually incurred by the intern. It's important to not refer to stipends as wages for compensation for work performed. And you should consider paying your stipends on a different schedule than what you pay your regular employees. So if you're paying your regular employees every other Friday, consider giving the stipend either at the beginning of the internship or at the end. The safest way to avoid an issue under this factor is to just offer no compensation at all. An intern who receives no compensation and signs an agreement acknowledging that they have no expectation of compensation will easily meet the sixth factor. Paying interns even just a little for helping could potentially transform them into employees. Instead, consider what occasional non-monetary gifts you may be able to provide, giving them like awards or plaques or a luncheon in recognition of their work. So this lays out a few things that should be in any signed agreement with an intern. One, the intern should agree that he or her is not an employee. Uh, it should state that the internship is unpaid. There's no expectation of compensation. It should set the duration of the internship, so you have a set end date and start date. It should state that the intern is not entitled to a job at the conclusion of the internship and should state that internship is provided in connection with an academic program, if that is part of the program. The important thing to know, though, is even if you have an agreement that states all of these things, 
your behavior and interactions with the intern must back it up. Even though the agreement may label an individual an intern, the six factors discussed earlier should still be met. Uh, a worker who is properly an employee under the FLSA cannot just waive his or her rights by agreeing to work as an intern, even with a signed agreement. So based on the factors that we've discussed, here are some general tips to avoid an employee-employer relationship. One is to provide an educational experience. Consider collaborating with local schools, universities, or vocational programs so that students can receive academic credit for the internship. Avoid grunt work for your intern. Interns should not be performing janitorial, clerical, or other such work. Instead, create assignments that benefit the intern but provide more minimal value to the employer. Number three, provide formal training programs and supervision. Make sure that your interns are getting more supervision than what would be provided to your typical employees. Keep the training broad. Make sure the intern is learning things that are targeted at an industry as a whole rather than only things that are specific to the employer's actual operations. Never suggest there is an employment relationship. Avoid calling wages your stipend a wage or calling interns employees or anything that would suggest an employee-employer relationship. And limit the duration. A shorter duration is going to lessen the chance that an intern is going to be considered an employee. So here's an example of one potential internship program. A high school internship where students rotate in different career areas without settling on one occupation and working and working an excessive length of time and requiring close supervision. The DOL has said that this is an example of a proper internship. However, the more time a student spends in one job, it becomes more likely that the student is providing an advantage to the employer. So to avoid this, the student's placement should be career-oriented and not in an occupation where they're only performing menial tasks. This second example has formerly homeless participants signing, getting $40 a week to intern after signing a letter agreement that they are not employees. Interns receive some training, counseling, and progress reports, but do not receive significant supervision on low-level tasks. The work allows the nonprofit to offer their services at a below market rate. This is based on a case that found this type of arrangement an employee-employer relationship. In this case, the worker is expected to be paid and produce more benefits for the employer than what they received in return through the training. Um, some important factors for the court. The letter of agreement, even though it stated that they were not employees, was formulated after the employer heard of potential litigation. Although the interns gained job skills and work history that they would not have necessarily gotten otherwise, so they did receive some benefits, the lack of formal training and supervision made this more like an employee-employer relationship. Additionally, the nonprofit could not meet its quotas and its prices without intern labor, and it was able to compete against for-profit businesses with its cheaper intern labor. As the court said in this case, the economic reality is that the participants benefited from the defendant's efforts, but the defendants benefited more. So that's where you see the balancing approach that a lot of these factors are going to use. So what should you be concerned about if your interns are misclassified? In a helpful note, the DOL has said that internships at nonprofits are generally permissible and it has said it's reviewing the need for additional guidance on internships in the public and nonprofit sectors. However, the DOL has not articulated a different test for nonprofits, so they're advised to design their programs to meet as many of the six factors that we've discussed as possible. Further, just because the Department of Labor has indicated that it might not pursue a nonprofit for Fair Labor Standards Act violations on internships does not prevent former um, interns or current interns from filing suit against your nonprofit. For example, the case we just discussed, it was in the Southern District of New York, a um, group of trainees who were evaluated the same way as interns under the Act uh, won their suit against their nonprofit for FLSA violations. If your interns are actually employees, 
your organization could be subject to paying significant back wages and liquidated damages. So therefore, all organizations should consider how they can meet the six factors in their internship program. So that concludes my formal presentation. Um, thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have.